Well, I invite you to open your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 11. We're going to be looking at some verses out of Hebrews chapter 11. A character that you are pretty familiar with, but I think that uh, we'll see some things today that are, are new and fresh out of uh, the experience of so a very well-known character in the Bible. And before we get there, I'm going to brag a little bit. I know how to teach children to water ski. I know how to teach children to water ski. Now, I am not an exceptional skier myself. I've skied since I was probably about eight or nine years old. But I'm not a highly advanced water skier. Um, but I know how to teach kids to ski. And I learned from my older brothers. Three simple steps to teach children how to water ski. And these are basically the steps. You sit down on the back of your skis, you put your knees tight up to your chest, arms around your knees, keep your arms straight, and then you let the boat pull you up. So I taught water skiing to beginners at summer camp for a couple of summers when I was in my teens. What we'd do, we'd have Joey and Mary sit on the beach. We'd have their skis on them. They'd be sitting on the back of their skis, and we'd put the rope handle in their hands, and this is the rope that attaches to the rope handle, and we say, okay, knees tight to chest, arms straight, let the boat pull you up, and then you would simulate the boat pulling them up. Three simple steps. Knees bent, arms straight, let the boat pull you up. Three tries, almost all children learn how to ski. Here's what happens on the first attempt. Now, this uh, next picture is not really of one who uh, is a child, but it has fairly good form in illustrating how to get up out of the water. But what happens is this. First try, Joey or Mary tends to pull back with their arms, and phew, what happens is they lose their center of balance there, and they go down on their, on their hind end. But, you know, it's water. It doesn't hurt. Or they don't really give enough tension and they let the boat pull them over and they drink a little lake water in the process. The third time, they kind of get that sweet spot between pulling back in their arms and letting the boat simply just give them a big gulp of lake water and voila, they stand up. Knees bent, arms straight, let the boat pull you up. Three steps. Here's a picture of a youngster. I would think that uh, this young girl probably is uh, one of the first times that she's actually gotten up on the water. Uh, she's a little bit hunched over there, but she'll gain some confidence uh, very, very quickly to stand up a little bit more straightly. Now, this is a typical position of a skier who has learned how to be a little more confident. Now, does a child need to actually understand all of the physics involved in learning how to water ski, such as force and angle and center of gravity? No. All they need to know are three things. Knees tight to your chest, arms straight, let the boat pull you, out, pull you up out of the water. Now, you could give a long, detailed explanation you know, with graphs and formulas and everything about angle and, and uh, torque and all that, but it doesn't really matter. If you want to learn how to water ski, you follow the instructions. You obey the instructor, right? If you want to learn how to water ski. Okay, skiing lesson is now concluded. Some years ago, I heard about the rule of 72s as a way to estimate the time element for money to double. Some of you are aware of the rule of 72s, others of you are not. Here's the rule. You take the number 72 and you divide it by the annual rate of interest that your money is earning to determine the number of years that it will take for your money to double. For example, if you invest $10,000 in a certificate of deposit paying 4%, and I know that doesn't exist today, but it did exist a few years ago, and it may come back again. 
But if you take $10,000 in a certificate of deposit, paying 4%, compounded annually, it will take about 18 years for that $10,000 to double into $20,000. How does this work? Well, check it out. Maybe you'll understand this. We start with the general formula that P equals principal, that's your, uh, your amount of money you have, R equals the interest rate and Y the number of years. So you times P, but then you add 1 to the R and exponentially then add on the, the Y, the number of years. Got that? Okay. Now, I tried to understand this in a little bit more detail, how it really works. I, I studied it for a while, but I'm not a mathematician. And so I poked around on the internet and I found a little assistance online. So we have a professor here, I, I think from the University of Virginia, who's going to give us a little bit of assistance with um, how to understand the rule of 72s. Even if you don't follow the math, it's pretty simple. Just to make you familiar, I'll tell you how the, the, the whole system works. You just use the familiar future value calculation for a value that grows for n periods at a rate of growth, little r. And we'll input numbers like the present value of $1 and a future value of $2. And we'll solve that equation through a little bit of algebra. You take the natural logarithm of both sides. And you'll find that a number like 0.693 is approximately equal to n, which is the number of compounding periods, times the rate of growth, r. But since it's not really easy to divide numbers into 69.3, we just use a, a, a nearby number and one into which just about anything divides very, very simply, and that number is 72. Everybody got it? You understand? Don't you love that part about, uh, it's actually not a rule of 72, it's actually a 69.3. And I thought to myself, now how would that work? if I gave that explanation to the, uh, to the policeman in a speeding zone, you know? <laughs> well, you know, hey, I'm close to the speed limit. It doesn't really matter that much, does it? How many of you actually really understood what he said? Okay, I'm very, very impressed. Very, very impressed. That made about as much sense to me as this deep, deep philosophical question. If you were traveling down the road, an interstate, and a boat passed you, how many pancakes would it take to fill a doghouse, true or false? <laughs> I don't understand the rule of 72s, but it doesn't matter. I don't have to understand the rule of 72s for it to work. All I have to do is put in the elements to make it work. Do we understand everything that we experience? No. We don't understand a lot of things that we experience. Do you understand all the mechanisms involved in what happens when you press on the accelerator of your car? Or you then press on the brake pedal of your car. Well, when you press on the accelerator, that puts more fuel into the piston, and the piston goes up and down, and that's connected to the crankshaft, and blah, 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 blah. Or if you step on the brake, well, that activates the master cylinder, and it squeezes these little discs, or ex expands the shoes around your drum, whatever it is. Do you, under do you even think about that? No. We don't think about that. How does your body break down food and give energy to you. It uses the best and mm, gets rid of the rest. Um, how, how do you understand so many things that we use every day? We don't. We just experience it. We just live it out. We just do it. So whether it's water skiing or it's the rule of 72s or whether it's driving the car, a lot of these things we don't understand. We simply act upon the knowledge, the instruction, the counsel of someone else, and we live it out by faith, and it works. It works. 
Not randomly, the Bible's first words are these, in the beginning, God. In the beginning, God. No other intelligence predates God. There is no record that God had a mentor. God is not dependent upon the experience of another being who was before God. God is superior in every aspect. God has knowledge and experience. He knows what He's talking about. He knows what works and what does not work. And when it comes to life, what's important in life with God, faith is vital. Faith is required. Faith is essential. Without faith, it is impossible to please Him, the Bible claims. For he who comes to God must believe that He is and that He is a rewarder of those who seek Him. Faith, as we already considered from last week, is a risk. The issue is not if we are going to be people of faith. We are. The issue is what are we going to have faith in? To whom or to what will we direct our faith? It is impossible for us as human beings to be faithless. The question is, to what or to whom will we attach our faith? The source and the object of our faith are absolutely critical. That was the focus of last week's message, the first in this series. So moving on with the tour of the challenge of faith, we then recognize that faith assumes there is one who is wiser than me. Faith assumes there is one who has more experience than me. Faith assumes there is another who has what I need. And faith assumes that I will follow the instructional, the counsel of such a one. Faith, in short, assumes obedience. Faith assumes obedience. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. God called. By faith, Abraham believed. God said, in essence, Abraham Keep your knees bent, your arms straight, and I will pull you along. Review the Genesis record of this calling. Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken to him. These are huge promises. There is great appeal in these promises. There is great gain to be realized in these promises. There is great satisfaction and fulfillment to be realized. There is the promise of land, a core resource of wealth. There is the promise of recognition and influence. I will make of you a great nation. There is the promise of prestige. I will make your name great. There is the promise of meaning and fulfillment. You shall be a blessing. Abraham doesn't understand all that God is calling him, directing him to be and to do. Abraham does not even know the destination. He does not comprehend everything that this inheritance entails. He simply responds. God calls. Abraham responds. Abraham obeys. That's the Genesis record. Now, let's go to the New Testament, Hebrews chapter 11, as it looks back on this. By faith. Abraham dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Land, recognition, prestige, fulfillment, a city. All of these promises... Who wouldn't want that? 
So Abraham obeys. God calls. Abraham obeys. He does not see the evidence of everything yet. Remember, faith is the substance. It is the assurance. It is the confidence of things unseen. By faith, on the basis of confidence in God's words, God's promises, Abram obeys. He acts in accordance with God's instructions. Obedience becomes doable when you believe in its benefits. Let that settle. Obedience becomes doable when you believe in its benefits. By nature, we are creatures of self-interest. Even before sin infected the human race, we were creatures of self-interest. Eve took the fruit And she ate it because she believed the serpent's claim. She believed there was something to be gained by knowing evil as well as good. And Adam joined her because he believed that he could not do life without Eve. The devil blinded their perception. And the devil blinds our perception. He deceives. Jesus called him a liar. Later in the Bible, it informs us that the gospel is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this world has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is in the image of God, should shine on them. The devil leads us to conclude that obedience is restrictive. And that doing your own thing, going your own way, that is where the real freedom lies. But really, the opposite is true. Obedience is liberating, and doing my own thing, doing your own thing, is actually restrictive of genuine freedom. But when you begin to see through the lies, beyond the lies, when you begin to identify what is really real, when you focus upon God's promises and provisions, obedience then becomes doable when you believe in its benefits. It appears that obedience, in many situations, requires a sacrifice of something that is familiar to us, something that is comfortable, something that is desirable for what God is calling us to be or to pursue. Look again at this call that God gave to Abraham. Now the Lord said to Abraham, get out of your country, get out from your family, and get out from your father's house. Get out from your country, your family, and you're from your father's house. Your your, your. Get out from your. Abraham, leave what is comfortable to you. Because I'm going to do something with you, Abraham, that I will not be able to do if you stay where you're at. So get out from your. Now note again what follows. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now look at this closely. What Abraham has are, what Abraham has to consider are the following. He has three yours compared to two greats and four blessings. So he's going to trade in three yours for two greats and four blessings. That's actually doubling in value with his three oars. And that kind of sounds like the rule of 72s to me. God could have blessed Abraham and made him great in the land, the community of his father. He could have done that, but that's not God's choice. That's not God's plan. Remember, God is the one who has the experience and the knowledge. God calls Abraham to leave his yours so that Abraham will then become focused on God's I wills. One more time. Look at this again. 
Abraham, leave your land for a land I will show you. Furthermore, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will bless those who bless you. And I will curse him who curses you. So leave your three yours, get your two greats and four blessings while you focus on my five I wills. Obedience becomes doable when you believe in its benefits. But obedience requires a sacrifice of something that is comfortable to me, something that is desirable to me, in order that I may experience what God desires for me. In her high school years, Grace Daly was first team, all-state athlete, as well as Nike and Parade All-American athlete. Basketball was not her only strength. She also ran track, and she won the 800-meter state championship in her freshman year. Not only was she a gifted athlete, she was gifted academically. She was always in the top ten of her class. She went to Tulane University on a full-ride basketball scholarship. At Tulane, her career really began to take off. Over her four years, she poured into the bucket 2,249 points, making her the school's all-time leading scorer, male or female. She was inducted into the Hall of Fame for Tulane University in 2006. She led Tulane's basketball team to two conference championships, four straight NCAA berths, and in 1999, she was named her tournament MVP, and she won nearly every award that could be handed out. College ended. She was drafted into the WNBA. She started with the Minnesota Lynx. Her career spanned four years with four different WNBA teams, but she wasn't satisfied just to play basketball in the United States. She went to Europe, and so she played in Spain and Italy and France and the Czech Republic. She played in Europe because it allowed her to play all year long. But the European leagues only allow two American players per team. So you have to be one of the top American players in order to play in Europe. And she was in that category. Her wallet began to show it as well. But then she received the accolades in Europe. She led the Italy pro team to uh, scoring in, in the 2002 and 2003 season. They named her the most valuable player of the French pro league in 05 and 06. And she was then selected to the European all-star team. And she was picked to play on the International Basketball Federation. And then suddenly, suddenly at the peak of her career, decorated with accomplishments, Grace decided to quit at the top of her game. Why quit when the coaches are raving about you, when the crowds are roaring, when the photographers are clicking their cameras, when the interviews are taking place and the money is beginning to pour in? That's no time to quit unless something changes. Daly had grown up in a Christian home. Her parents were faithful Christians. She had been baptized at the age of eight. Her mother and father rejoiced in her baptism. But eight years later, when she was 16, her parents left the church of their history and joined the Seventh-day Adventist church. Now, that didn't seem like a big deal to Grace at the time. It was just a change of day in which you go to church. Daly looks back. I thought it was as simple as changing the day when we went to church and everything else would remain the same. The change at that time did not interfere with her sports. She carried on with her activities through college and into her professional career. But in the summer of 2007, she had to go see a doctor. And she didn't realize that this doctor, Don Bavell, would be a game changer for her life. It actually wasn't the doctor, it was the doctor's wife. Couldn't find a picture of her, but the doctor's wife, her name is Anne. And she is this delightfully extroverted person. She's a designer and a builder, and she connected with Grace. And they begin to spend time together. 
And Anne began to open up the scriptures to Grace in a way that Grace had never before seen. And soon she became convicted of some things, and she immediately determined to end her professional basketball career because she began to see Jesus in the scriptures in a way that she had never seen him before. Contained in his words, she says, are his commandments, and contained in his commandments is the Sabbath. She had rediscovered Jesus in everything he is connected to. My goals, she reflects, were once centered on maximizing my basketball potential and helping my teams win games. Now my goals are centered on maximizing both my spiritual and my physical potential as a player on Jesus' team. And now, she's a PE coach in an elementary school in Ocala, Florida. She was chosen as the rookie teacher of the year in her district, her first year. For grace, obedience becomes doable when you believe in its benefits. How long would Grace have experienced her professional basketball career? Probably 15, 17, maybe 18 years, probably into her late 30s. And she would have had a great career. And after that career had concluded, she would have been well set for a very comfortable life. But Grace saw a bigger picture than professional basketball. She saw a life that went beyond the arena, beyond the applause, beyond the, photo, uh, the photographers and the interviews. She saw the experience of being a blessing to others that had eternal significance because of the blessing that Jesus had become to her. Obedience becomes doable when you believe in its benefits. Are there any yours? Are there any yours that God is calling you to leave so that you can experience His greats, His blessings? as you focus on His I wills. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Without faith, it is impossible to please Him. Why faith? Why faith? Because as you recall from our prior focus earlier in this series, faith connects us to Him as our provider. Faith leads us to dependence upon Him. Faith requires focus. Faith requires attention. Faith requires our devotion, requires our seeking. Faith necessitates that relationship. And faith, our faith, assumes obedience. And obedience becomes doable when you believe in its what? Benefits. Faith calls us to leave our yours in exchange for His blessings, His greats. Abraham's experience of faith was simply a precursor. It was a preview of the obedience challenge in the faith experience of Jesus. Note the correlations from this New Testament explanation. Christ Jesus who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. Jesus leaves his, yours, which was equal status with God. Just as God called Abraham to leave his, yours, his country, his family, his father's house, and more specifically, it was Jesus himself who called Abraham to leave, so Jesus does the same. Jesus leaves his, yours. Jesus is yours was his equal status with God and as God. Jesus is yours was his heavenly community, his celestial home. He left that and he journeyed to a far planet, planet Earth, and he took on humanity and the bond and the form of a bond servant. Now the faith challenge in obedience is clearly expressed. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient, even to the point of death 
death on a cross. But he's not left there. He does not end there. There is greatness to come because obedience results in greatness and blessing. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name that is Jesus. Every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and those under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. We owe everything to the obedience, the faith obedience of Jesus. Without his faith obedience, we would not be, period. Obedience becomes doable when you believe in its benefits. And amazingly, astonishingly, Jesus believed his benefit is us. It's you. It's me. Is God calling? Is he calling you to leave something of yours so that you can experience his blessings, his greatness? We've heard it a couple of times this morning already from the piano, from the guitar, and it's time that we sing it. Trust and obey. When we walk with the Lord in the light of His Word, what a glory He sheds on our way. While we do His goodwill, He abides with us still and with all who will trust and obey. Will you stand as we sing together?